this is the most hostile environment on Earth. But the key to our future may lie in the deep. Far from rules and oversight, the ocean floor is now at the center of a tug of war between exploitation and conservation. Two thirds of the planet is covered by water. It's our planet's wildest frontier, breathtaking as much as it is vital to all life. A place of discovery and endless reinvention, a metaphor for freedom, as well as a profoundly dystopian realm where the darkest of all humanities play out. Over 50 million people work at sea and human rights and environmental abuses often occur with impunity. Six, of you. Six people are sleeping in here. So hot. This is, un I've never ever seen this bad. My name is Ian Urbina. As a journalist, I've spent the past decade reporting from this lawless frontier. I run an investigative journalism organization called the Outlaw Ocean Project that reports about crimes happening in this space. This is the Outlaw Ocean. The deep sea is our planet's largest ecosystem. It's also the largest depository of minerals. For millennia, that wealth remained untapped but cutting edge technology is opening this new frontier to both exploration and exploitation like never before. In 2017, I traveled on board a Greenpeace ship to the Barents Sea, far north of Russia and Finland. That oil, the partly state-run Norwegian oil company, was intent on drilling the seabed for more oil. And we are here to conduct a peaceful protest. This is Arctic sunrise. Unfortunately, what I cannot consider the extraction of oil from this remote area of the Barents Sea to be a safe practice. Boat crew is ready to launch now and then everybody else ready at the pilot door. In international waters, the oil industry had reached a new level of risk-taking. No company had ever tried to drill this far north in the Arctic. Norway had signed the Paris Agreements pledging to curtail fossil fuel extraction, and yet it continued to prospect and drill. The murky laws that govern the high seas played fully in their favor. I'm asking you as a captain yeah. to take up the people from the water because uh, my ship is going to tug this ship. That's an order. This Greenpeace protest ended in failure. Its equipment confiscated, its vessel towed away by the Norwegian Coast Guard on request of the oil company. One thing that we're going to continue is persist, and we will continually protest until we hear that the oil rig has stopped drilling. The Statoil project proceeded with barely a delay. These oil platforms are just a few kilometers off the Brazilian coast. Here, the semi-public corporation Petrobras and other international companies are extracting oil from beneath the seabed. This type of extraction is expensive. News reports on expanded drilling off the coast of South America sparked my next journey to Brazil. We have 10 degrees port rudder. We're making our turn to 033. I joined local scientists on board the Esperanza, where Greenpeace activists were challenging South America's biggest oil producer from drilling near a coral reef at the mouth of the Amazon River. Given what I had witnessed in the Barents Sea, I didn't hold much hope for the Esperanza's crew. You're 
here's where we are now and this is showing uh, 2.2 meters at seven seconds from the north to east. Brazil's government had abandoned control to the oil companies, accepting their reassurance that no harm would be done to the ecology around the reef. Greenpeace's goal was to empower Brazilian scientists to document what might be at stake if the drilling were to go ahead. Nobody has properly surveyed this reef except the oil companies that are looking for oil, so they know it's down here, but they're being quiet about it. They're not letting the Brazilians know that there's coral reefs and sponges and rotoliths and an interesting biome of life down here, most likely new species that have not even been discovered here. It's a travesty. Poorer countries do not have the resources to both independently assess the risks to offshore ecosystems and to fact check the oil companies. The scientists were in a race against time and vast oil company resources, a classic David and Goliath. We live on the water planet. Most of the surface of our planet is, is water and 98, 99% of the livable habitat is, is ocean. It's amazing to me where we would risk things like this where we don't even understand what we have to begin with. There have been major discoveries in the ocean, sponges especially, and this is a really important sponge area, that provided major medical breakthroughs. We could find the cure for cancer, or we could destroy it with an oil spill before we even know what we have. Besides the medical secrets that could be unlocked, explorers and extractors are also looking at the seafloor for solutions to wean ourselves from our modern dependence on fossil fuels. This is what treasure looks like, a polymetallic nodule so rich that some research suggests it could replace our need to mine on land for cobalt, lithium, nickel, and manganese, essential to power our batteries vital to our green revolution. The rewards might be great, but so are the risks. Waste from mining alone can travel through the ocean and damage nearby seamounts and coral reef systems. This would in turn put more fish stocks at risk. Many small South Pacific nations feel very differently. Their prosperity and future depend on their ocean floors. The ocean is the next frontier for mining, and Nauru is part of a pioneering venture that could soon power the world's green economy. I believe that Nauru will, will benefit greatly. Nauru has for centuries been plundered by colonial powers for its rich phosphate. Now large swaths of this Pacific island are uninhabitable. With nothing left to exploit on land, this tiny republic is now turning to its ocean floor. It has applied to the International Seabed Authority, the ISA, to license its drilling. The ISA is an independent body that regulates the ocean floor in international waters. If Nauru gets permission, it's likely to start the next gold rush. Aboard the Esperanza, the team of marine biologists are celebrating. The Brazilian government reversed its decision to block the expedition. The mission can go forward. We have an authorization, man. Well, let's go change course. So we're turning around and going back to the position where we went to do the dive, but it appears like we have permission. mind-altering. I mean, 
The closest thing I can compare it to is when you're in a plane and you're flying through the clouds and you know you're moving, but you have a hard time measuring it or understanding it because you're in the midst of this blinding thing. And then when you touch the floor, a cloud of silk surrounds you. And as the cloud of dust settles, you can begin to make out the terrain that looks almost like the moon's surface, at least where we were, and these structures, you know, a coral wall. So here we are at the bottom of the Amazon reef. We are approaching uh, what looks to be a large mound. Deep Parker, Deep Parker, hull copy on VHF 69, over. I had imagined the seafloor to be barren, but discovered it was the total opposite. What I found was an exotic netherworld, full of wondrous forms of life that no longer fitted the neat animal, mineral, vegetable categories. The lesson I learned was that precisely because they were so alien, not only unknown to science, but also so far removed from the decision-making on land, these creatures and their habitat were even more vulnerable to destructive exploitation. One of the challenges with the ocean is that so much of it is out of sight. And it's easy to imagine that there's really nothing very interesting down there. We've seen how important that can be. Once people see it, they, they want to protect it. It, makes, it changes the way they feel about their ocean, about our ocean. Minerals are inextricably linked to the rise of mankind and civilization. But today, a very different and much more precarious balance is at play. I want to see us have a new approach to how we think about our oceans in general, our planet, not even just the ocean, and not just short-term gains that we can make from taking and taking and taking, drilling, mining, fishing. In Brazil, the scientists won an important battle, but the larger war for the ocean floor has only just begun. industry routinely chooses to feed powdered wild fish to their farmed fish in order to fatten them up and sell them faster. Fish meal is a very inefficient food source that actually worsens depletion of ocean fish stocks rather than slowing it. 